Hello everybody and welcome back to Writer's Block, the channel where I help you to plan, write, edit and publish your novel. My name is Joshua Bennett, author of this book right here. And today we're talking about how to add depth and complexity to your characters. In the first video, we built you a basic character. We gave you a bunch of questions to ask to build a character, but those questions were not very in depth and it will only work to build you a basic character. Now it's time to build dimensions around them, to build the depth and to build the complexity. It's time to send them on character arcs and change them throughout your story and hopefully connect your readers to them and make them memorable. Number one, character arcs. Character arcs are the personal inward journeys that your characters go through. It can be as simple as learning to like a new food or befriending someone that maybe they thought they wouldn't have been friends with, or it can be as complicated as converting to a new religion or loving or hating a group of people. The character arc doesn't necessarily have to be either good or evil. All it has to be is the change that your character goes through. Having your characters change and evolve throughout your story is a great way to make them three-dimensional and more believable. For a good example of a character arc that's neither good nor evil, I present Jake Sully from Avatar. He starts on one side, he starts on the human side, goes through the movie and has a change of heart and ends up on the side of the Na'vi. His choice and his personal growth were neither good nor bad. He just had a change of heart and that's how he grew through the story. Number two, redemption arcs. This is the character arc that your villain, antagonist, or in the very rare case, your main character will go through your main character if you're writing particularly grey characters, and it's their transition from evil to good. This character is all about how a bad person redeems himself for the evil that he has caused in the world. For a great example of a very good redemption arc, I'd direct your attention to Avatar The Last Airbender. For a very arguable example of a redemption arc, I would direct your attention to Snape from the Harry Potter series. Did he deserve a redemption arc? Did he get a redemption arc? That's all up to interpretation, and a lot of people like to argue about those points. Let me know what you think below. Another very well-known and very popular redemption arc is that of Darth Vader. He was the movie's big bad villain. He spent the whole time killing the rebels and trying to convert Luke to the dark side. But he redeems himself in the last moments by sacrificing his life to save Luke and kill the Emperor. Number three, good to evil arcs. You don't see a lot of good to evil arcs, which is why if they're done right, they can be so engaging and audience love them so much. This is when you have a morally good or a morally righteous character that for some reason or another turns to the bad side, becomes a morally bad character. This is usually either done for reasons of power or some form of incredibly sympathetic reason like the death of a loved one, or finding the ability to protect a loved one or bring them back to life. For an example, we go back to Star Wars, specifically episode one, two, and three. Anakin is believed to be the chosen one, the person that'll bring balance to the force and save the universe. But he loses his mother and he doesn't agree with the Jedi's treatment of him. And he also doesn't agree with the Jedi stopping him from being with the woman he loves, Padme. When he starts fearing that Padme will die and in the process kill their children, he's turned by the promise of the Emperor that he can save their lives. He can grant Anakin the power to save the ones that he loves. He's also turned away by the Jedi because they will not grant him the rank that he deserves. So this person who was built up as the ultimate good, the person that will save the world, turned away from his destiny to save the world and all the good because he was slighted by the Jedi Order, the order that he'd devoted his life to, and by the idea of saving the life of the woman he loved and his unborn kids. While a lot of people don't like the actor that plays Anakin, or like episode one, two, or three, you can't deny that the reasons he turns are for very sympathetic reasons. It's a man that devoted his life to a job, gave them all of his loyalty, 
and they give him no loyalty in return. And then on top of that, he wants to save the life of the woman he loves and his unborn kids. This is great because it grounds the reader in the question, what would you do to save the people that you love? And why should you have loyalty to people that do not have loyalty to you? Number four, mental scars. Mental scars are a great way to humanize your characters. So often we see action heroes that will just run through some town, wherever they are, kill everybody that they see, have a big smile on their face and just keep going as if it's all just a big game. And that's fine in movies because you don't need to connect with those characters. But in books, that's not okay. You need to be able to connect with your characters. Giving your characters mental scars shows that they are real people dealing with real consequences to the bad things that have happened to them. For example, maybe they can't sleep because they've killed someone and now that's all they see in their dreams. Maybe they almost drowned and their mental scars are so severe it's to the point where that person can't even drink water because their body will freak out and reject it. And the only way that this person can stave off dehydration is by eating moisture-rich foods. A great example of mental scars in literature is Katniss from The Hunger Games. How she reacts to having killed people, the hallucination she sees, the dreams she has, and just the sheer stress that was caused to her from being in The Hunger Games. And to a further extent, the scars that are visible with Haymitch. He won his Hunger Games and he's been a dysfunctional alcoholic ever since. Number five, power escalations. More so, earned and believable power escalations. Nothing makes your characters less believable than suddenly being great at everything. It's a delicate balance between long power escalations that bore your readers and short power escalations that feel cheap and unearned. This is why a lot of people say that they are sick of the chosen one trope because the power escalation that the Chosen One usually gets is very sudden and very extreme, which can feel very cheap and unearned, especially if the magic system that they've just got this massive power spike in is very complex or very difficult to master, and the people around them have been dedicating their lives to mastering this magic system, and this kid that's never done it before has suddenly become the best in the world at it because they're the chosen one. A good idea for power escalation is actually seen in Harry Potter. His power escalates the more he goes to school. He's the chosen one, but by no means is he a overly powerful wizard. Hermione is actually viewed as a much better wizard than Harry because she goes to school and she studies and she devotes so much of her time to being the best that she can be. She is the better wizard because she applies herself more. but. Undeniably, they all become stronger the more that they go to school. Another great example of good power escalation is Avatar The Last Airbender. It takes the Avatar a long time to learn all the elements. It takes the Avatar whole seasons before he becomes proficient in elements. And even then, his waterbending never surpasses Katara's skill. His earthbending never surpasses Toph's skills. He's the chosen one and can bend all four elements and is destined to become this amazing bending prodigy. But during the story, he never becomes this overpowered killing machine. The other benders all seem to have a stronger ability to bend than him. He can just bend more elements. For an example of a bad power escalation, I'm going to do a bit of a weird one here. And that's Elizabeth Swan from Pirates of the Caribbean. In this movie, she's the governor's daughter. She's living this uh, high-class life of a high-class lady during that era. She's then taken away by the bad guys because they believe that her blood will undo the curse. She then gets saved and goes back to her island. And then Pirates of the Caribbean 2 starts. And all the characters are again whisked off on their adventures. The difference is, though, that when Elizabeth goes in and starts sword fighting with people, she suddenly become this incredible sword fighter, killing career pirates and cursed sea monsters. This power escalation feels cheap and unearned because all around her, there's Will Turner, who was a blacksmith that would train for hours every day 
so that if he would ever see a pirate, he'd be able to beat him in a sword fight. There's Jack Sparrow, who was a pirate and a scallywag for as far back as he can remember. There's Commodore Norrington, who was a Korean Navy man. All these people have expertise in their fighting skills because they've all trained for years and years. And then there's Elizabeth Swan, who was a pampered governor's daughter, now suddenly has the same abilities to fight as all these career soldiers. This example doesn't matter so much because the movie is intended for younger audience, but if this was to be written as a character in a story, it would create problems. Number six, what does that character stand for? Having your character stand for a moral, a principle, or a religious value can instantly add depth to your characters. People will give up opportunities and refuse to do things that they want to do on a moral reason or a religious reason. And furthermore, they will do terrible things and evil things in the cause of a religion or a cause that they stand behind. Take World War I and World War II, for example. People did terrible things to each other because they believed in their cause. Number seven, what are they willing to die for? A lot like the last step, but a little different because what someone's willing to stand for and what someone's willing to die for can be very different things. Someone, for example, might dedicate their life to saving the planet. They might recycle, they might do all kinds of activism, they might become vegan and do everything that they can in their power to create a better planet for people. But then perhaps a millionaire needs a lung transplant gets in contact with this person and says, hey, if you give me your lungs, I will put solar panels on all of Canada, America, and Australia, and I will remove all plastic from the ocean, but I need your lungs and then you will die. Would your character give up his life for the cause of helping the planet? Probably not. However, Joan of Arc was willing to go into battle and die for her cause, being her god, her religion. She was even burnt at the stake and refused to denounce her god. The crusaders of the Great Crusade also did the same thing for their religion. In a bit more uh, of a recent history, maybe you've got a gang member and he's facing death row and the only way that he can avoid death row is if he snitches on his gang. Would your character be willing to die for his gang? His belief that you don't snitch? Number eight, character flaws. Nothing makes your characters more believable, more interesting, and more engaging than having flaws. Nobody wants to read about the 100% good guy that's morally righteous anymore. People want to read about flawed characters because people themselves are flawed. Maybe you've got a character that's great at everything and his flaw is that he's got a super cocky attitude because of how great he is at everything. And because he's so cocky, nobody wants to work with him. And you can be the greatest at everything, but if nobody wants to work with you, then none of that matters. Or maybe you have a character that keeps messing everything up, but they're incredibly humble. And so people love them for that. When making characters flawed, it's a good idea to build on the basics that we touched on in the last video. Was your character very poor, so they didn't go to school at all, and so now they're an adult that can't read, and it's a very sore point for that character? Did they have way too many brothers or sisters, and now they'll do anything for the smallest scrap of attention that they can get their hands on? Did they have a really bad breakup, and now they hate everyone of the opposite gender? Are they secretly in the closet and overcompensate by overtly hating gay people? These are character flaws that are built from other basic aspects of their lives, which makes them more relatable and more believable. Other character flaws that you might want to consider are alcoholism, reckless behavior, drug addiction, abuse in any form, and many, many more. A good example of a flawed character is Sherlock Holmes. He's this brilliant detective, very smart and very observant. This makes for an average story. You've got a detective that'll solve mysteries and he's great at everything he does. But then you add depth to his character by making him a jerk. 
So now he's an incredible asset to the people that need him, but they don't want to use him because he's such a jerk. Then on top of that, you add in his drug addiction, a personal battle that he has to face every single day. And then suddenly you've gone from this perfect character that can solve mysteries to a drug addict jerk that's an asset to the people that need him if they can stand him. A bad example of a flawed character is Superman. This guy is perfect in every way, shape and form. He can fly, he can shoot lasers out of his eyes, he's indestructible, he's super strong. He can pretty much do anything that he wants to do. And his only character flaw is that he's an alien, so he kinda doesn't really understand people. I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a secret. I'm an introvert, which means I don't really understand people either. So surely I'd be able to relate to Superman. Except, you know, I can't fly or shoot lasers or am perfect in any of those other ways. Number nine, what have they lost? Having a character lose something that is incredibly important to anybody is a great way to add instant depth to your character. And I don't specifically mean the trope where a man has lost his wife and now suddenly he's out on a mission for revenge and all the ladies want to be with him, but he can't emotionally give them what they want because his heart only belongs to his wife, who he's out to avenge because she died. But he will still bang all these other women, just no attachment, because the only person he's attached to is his dead wife, who he's avenging. Characters can lose lots of important things to them. Things that define them, like their faith in a religion or their faith in the government, they can lose their minds entirely from a traumatic event or some bizarre consequence of magic. They can lose their limbs, their freedom, their security, their house, their car. These are all things that people lose in the real world. And these are all things that can have a profound effect on the psychology of your character and how they perceive the world. For example, if your religion compelled you to do good things for people and then suddenly you've lost your faith in your religion, you may not only stop doing good things, but you may start to overcompensate and start do bad things. It may turn you on a path of evil because you've lost your faith. Number 10. How do they fit into the peer group? How your character fits into their peer group can add layers of complexity to your character. Say for example, they are incredibly introverted but around their best friends, they become incredibly extroverted. They could also be reckless, the leader, the loyal follower, a follower just because it benefits them, or a snake in a grass that will turn on their friends the first opportunity they get. A good example of this is real life peer pressure. People do all kinds of ridiculous and crazy things because they're peer pressured into it. And a further extent of this is the herd mentality. People in a large group feel like Laws no longer apply to them and they suddenly become indestructible. That's all the points I have about how to add layers and complexity to the characters in your novel. Hopefully this was helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. Comment below any questions you might have. I'll link my next video here. And thank you very much.